Uh, everybody, please thank Alec for a wonderful talk on documentation and generation. Okay, uh, if you have a lightning talk that you would like to present, there are still two slots on the, on the whiteboard, so uh, uh, put your name down if you are interested in, in giving a lightning talk. We'll be starting those in a few minutes. Uh, we'll be keeping mostly to the running order that's on the board, except we'll be starting with, uh, with Nick Steenhout as uh, his setup's going to be slightly more complicated than it is for others. Do you need me to open the door? The door's at one point. Yeah, I, I knew that. <laughs> Hello, 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 how's that? Great. Make this the last call for lightning talks. If you have a lightning talk to give, please put your name on the whiteboard before I get to the whiteboard to take your photo. Otherwise, we won't have your talk. Almost made it. No more takers. I'm just seeing if I've got the deck or not. If I have no deck. Oh, okay. I'm very close. So. Yeah, just call. Sounds good. Okay. We're good. I think we're good, yeah. Um, are we good? So it's time for the lightning talks here at the Developers Developers Miniconf, which is the last session for the day. Um, is uh, Vaibhav Sagar here? Great, so you'll be up next. Uh, but our first presenter today is Nick Steenhout, who's going to be talking about to alt or not to alt. Please make him... Good afternoon. So this is not a hardcore dev talk. It's a talk for devs that are doing mostly front-end or anyone who is in a position at any point in their life to write a blog post and use images. So I think that's pretty much all of us. Um, so we often hear an image is worth a thousand words until, well, until, um, yeah, until you're blind and you rely on a screen reader and there's no alt attribute on your image. So it's really mission critical to talk about, uh, to use 
the alt attribute. So you may hear sometimes people talk about the alt tag. Um, no, it's not an alt tag, it's not a tag, it's an attribute. And it's important to understand the difference because if you're starting to look at the HTML description of what the tag is, you will not find the alt attribute in there. So interestingly enough, um, the image tag came in into uh, HTML in 1992. The alt attribute came into HTML in 1995. That means that for th about three years, anybody who used a screen reader could not actually access images. And my friend Horacio came into my office one day. He was so frustrated. He came in and he says, Nick, everybody's talking about alt, uh, about images, and I can't see anything. The only thing my screen reader tells me is image, image, image. So um, that's a bit of background. How do we do alt? Well, there's two ways. We either put an alt attribute with actual text, or we put in an alt attribute with no text, which is often referred to as null. Um, so we have a wonderful warm photo of a skier on a ski ski going down a hill. And um, we can decide whether this is informative or decorative. And that's one of the critical thing when you're starting to write alt attributes, uh, alt text, is you decide whether the image is informative or decorative. But how do you decide? It really depends on the context. Now, the link there is to a resource on the W3C that basically takes you through the process of deciding what's decorative, what's informative. But generally speaking, when you have an image that's just there for eye candy, for just making the text looks good, you just use uh, a null alt. I'm going fast. I'm covering a lot. But we're getting to a bit of code here. Um, one of the issues with alt is that if you use an image as a link, you end up with um, an empty link. So if you have code like this where you have, uh, you decide the image is actually not informative and you use an all, null alt, when the screen reader comes to the link, it will allow us, hey, there's a link here, but because there's no alt attribute, uh, no text in it, it will not say anything. So the user, uh, the screen reader user, will have no idea where the link goes, which is kind of problematic. So a better way would be to use the description of the image. So when the person gets to the link, the alt attributes is read as the text content. We sometimes also have a problem with duplicate link text. So if you have, like here, a, um, an image, then you have the header, then you have text, and you create a link for both the image and the text, you end up with, uh, with the screen reader announcing pretty much the same thing twice. And it's also a problem for people that are um, keyboard user but that are sighted because you just created one more tab stop. So what you want to do is try to um, use an empty alt attribute, but if you do it that way, then you go back to the problem that you have an empty link, which is problematic. So the better way to do is you wrap the entire thing, your header, your image, and your text in a link. And that will create something that's more accessible for screen reader users, for sighted keyboard only users. And that's the end of my things. If you want to refer to links, the um, slides are there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick. Thank you. Okay, so um, on deck we have Steve Ellis, but first we have uh, Vibab uh, Cigar, if you can uh, plug in here, and I'm going to take that microphone. Where's the microphone? There's the microphone. Thanks, Tom. Sorry, uh, what are you looking for? Just HDMI. Yeah, uh, uh, HDMI is that one. Oh, 
Oh yeah, and I normally start the timer once you've plugged in and the machine's been detected, so yeah, the time started. <laughs> I think it's entirely reasonable. Cool. So. Hi, everyone. Um, today I'm here to talk to you about abusing CI for fun and profit. So this is Travis CI, uh, and this is Circle CI. Yeah. No. Never mind. This is Circle CI. They both um, build a CI applications, which means that if you submit your code to them, they will build it and run your tests. And that's what, I think that's what CI means. But really, um, what that means is that you can basically give them code and they'll do things to it. And what do they do? Uh, you can, like, as I said, the, the first thing you can do is run your tests. And I mean, that's, that's all right. That's, but I think that's the most, the least interesting thing CI does. Like, it runs your tests. But essentially, it'll run a script on any code that you check in. And that's really cool because uh, a lot of people use it to do things like build their websites. So they build their website. And uh, it pushes it to you know, either a website or some other, um, sorry, uh, either, either a branch, uh, if you use GitHub pages or uh, a different platform like Netlify or something like that. So you can build your, uh, um, you can build your website with it. But you can, you can do a bit more. I'm like, OK. So suppose I want to have my resume up to date. And you know, like, a, like a developer, I put it in source control. What if I could get CI to build my resume for me? And it's doable. You just do it. <laughs> put it in code. You put a. Put a make file in that builds a PDF. You edit, you know, you do lots of fiddling with Travis, but then at the end of the day, you can have um, your resume up. That's great. Next thing you, the next thing I tried to do, hey, so I have all my slides for my presentations, and uh, it would be really nice to be able to just edit these in GitHub or you know on a text editor and like have everything in version control and then just have that go on my website. So it turns out you can use Travis CI for that too. And um, if you, oh, and I, I have everything linked up to my. Um, my, yeah, anyway, so I have, I have all my presentations, like, for example, the one that I'm giving tomorrow. So that, that works too, uh, and that's really easy because, um, yeah, the, the, the file for that is very straightforward. Uh, the most complicated thing is the file that actually updates uh, my GitHub pages after, after a successful build. So, so, so far I've told you that uh, it'll do a build every time there's a commit. And, like, that's great, but sometimes you don't want to do a commit. Sometimes you want to do um, a build, like, every so often. And, it seems like so far that's, that's the only limitation. But it turns out that Travis does support cron as well. So you can, like with Travis or with any other um, CI tool, you can probably like set up a way so that it builds every day, every minute, or every hour. And if you, know, if you want more flexibility, um, you can set up your own hosted CI solution. But the uh, point I'm trying to make here is that CI isn't just about building your tests. It's about running, it's like about automating a process um, you know, usually on a git commit, but for any other reason as well. And that's all I have for you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so up after Steve is going to be Alec Clues. Um, Steve is very cleverly not plugging his laptop. Oh, he already has it. Time has started. Steve Ellis, everyone. Right. This is a bit of a change. Usually I'm at things like the sysadmin mini-conf. So, but I'm a former developer, and I still like to get my hands dirty. And I love the fact that our OpenShift community has made lives very easy for developers who want to get to grips with things like Docker and Kubernetes, et cetera. So if you take anything out of this, just grab. I've got nothing up on screen. We got a sync issue. I know it's like join the squares. Why are they not mirroring? Uh, that's putting out 1080, so that's a problem. Uh, go up to the top and go in there. Single display. No, they're not mirroring. No, apply. Is it, uh, here we go. OK, keep changes. Ah, uh, right, lovely. It's going and put my display up there. Okay, so um, I, what I've done is I've wrapped up some of the work around OpenShift. There's a, a, a GitHub repository with all the details, all the links. Have any of you used OpenShift? OpenShift Online, OpenShift Origin? 
How many of you use Docker and Kubernetes and technologies like that? So this is a great wrapper for getting your hands dirty really, really quickly. Have a look at the OpenShift Origins site. It's got a whole load of background about how to get started with OpenShift. Whether you're a Mac user or a Linux user or a Windows user, it's fairly easy. There's some nice wrappers. One issue with those wrappers is they don't easily deal with a lot of the immediate dependencies to get your environment up and running. So um, crazily on Friday, I decided to create a project with a Ansible playbook. How many of you use Ansible? Ansible users, Ansible's awesome. So this deals with all the dependencies, whether you're on Red Hat or CentOS. Uh, pull requests welcome for you, Ubuntu and Debian users, etc. So this will deal with all of the firewall dependencies, all the little extra nooks and crannies to make sure your environment behaves nicely. So what we're going to do, if I can hit the right key combination, is I'm going to start a brand new RHEL 7 server that's had the uh, environment knitted because I knew that we only had a few minutes being this is a, a mini call, uh, sorry, a lightning talk. So that's all up and running. I'm going to jump to another console and log in. And an extra console uh, log in. This is really hard with the mic. <laughs> so you can see what's going on. We're going to run. I'm going to create an open, OpenShift cluster. I'm going to make sure that my public host name is logged in, is uh, slotted in, so that it's a publicly accessible IP address, so that I can do some development work. This is going to go off, and normally it will pull down the required Docker images from the uh, OpenShift community and bootstrap you an OpenShift environment that's up and running in a little under about 20 seconds if it's got everything cached. So this should be good to go now. So I just need to copy that URL and jump to the page. Can't see I've ever seen admins felt like that before. Right. Yeah, and no, really hard. So oh, immediately I've got access to a whole range of kind of standard languages and runtimes uh, that are already there as pre-canned uh, Docker containers or uh, open container format containers. So I can just go and choose a technology. This, and they all come with sample uh, source to image uh, sites that would, you can use as a template. Source to image is a great way of plugging a few extra pieces of metadata into your existing source code repository so that the source to image process under OpenShift works and you can start rapidly deploying a range of container images for your existing projects. I need to say what project I'm going to give it. This allows for multi-user, multi-tenancy. 10, 9, 8, And seven. I'll say, point it at the sample repository, create, and now in, oh. Two. So I've already got that. Hey! Uh, come see me later, and I'll show you it all up and running, and yeah. you can get your projects working under OpenShift. Come and find Steve if you want to find out more about OpenShift. I'm sure he'll be here all week. Uh, up after Alec will be uh, Dawn. I'm assuming that's how you pronounce it. Yeah, that's yeah sure. Cool, that'll do. Um, our next presenter presented a talk not... 20 minutes ago. Um, I just saw the topic on the whiteboard. I'm, I'm sure it's a complete troll. Oh, it's not? Ooh, that's exciting. Ding, ding. Recently, I wrote a blog post um, on a company website about how to write XML RPC um, clients. Uh, not important why, or, or the article itself isn't important. What was interesting was that as part of this, I wrote a whole bunch of XML RPC clients in different languages to illustrate the talk. And I discovered, uh, or rediscovered, what I found was, was some really interesting things. Um, so, um, 
I implemented exactly the same thing five different ways, or in five different languages, um, and it, the, the results were quite interesting, and it's reinforced my view that actually Python's quite a cool language, uh, because, well, that's the Go one, we'll, we'll, start, we'll start with the, um, We'll start with the Python one. Um, so they're all, they're all called simple example number one. So this is the Python one. Um, it's really cool. Uh, you do some initialization. Uh, you do a couple of method calls. There's some exception blocks. And it all takes um, 38 lines of code. The other thing that's interesting is uh, that you set up a proxy method. And then you can just call. It just, it just magically knows what the uh, methods are on the other end of your uh, network connection, which is quite a cool feature. So uh, you go and look at another modern language. Um, so we'll look at Go. Um, and that's almost as good. So again, try and do exactly the same thing. Um, Certified library this time, it's not installed by default, it's 50 lines of code. Um, but it's still fairly okay, fairly easy to use. Um, the, the error, you know, we don't have exceptions in Go, uh, we use errors, um, so that logic's a bit different. Uh, but apart, and, and, and there's actually this wrapper to actually uh, go around it. Once you understand that complexity, it's pretty easy, but you just got to understand that bit. And that actually relates back to what I was talking about earlier about badly documented APIs. That, you want to go and look at that library? Now, the place that this got interesting for me was looking at the C version. Hmm. Um, I haven't written C for about 20 years, so I, start, I was going to get all misty-eyed about, about doing this, and then I actually had to implement it, and I got a lot less nostalgic. <laughs> <laughs> so that's nearly 100 lines to do exactly the same thing. Um, it, it's a lot harder because of the, you know it, it, there's no reflection. Setting up the data structures is really tough, um, and yeah, it's just a lot harder um, to to do the type conversions, to encode and decode things, uh, and to actually encode the method calls. So it was really really interesting to realise why C is no longer a popular choice because you know when I was. A young, a young programmer, you know, this, this was state-of-the-art stuff, this language, and we used to do fantastic things in it, and, and, and the world's moved on, and it's hard um, when you have gone through that process to understand why, you know, think that, why, how much things have changed and how much easier it is for us. Uh, the other thing that's, that's worth talking about is PHP. This is the first of a PHP program I wrote, hopefully my last. Um, but what's interesting about this was that I actually based this, I, I, so this is about the evolution of languages. So um, there was another example of this uh, from years and years ago that one of our programmers wrote. And I based, you know, I started to look at that. And that was actually a lot more awkward than this. But the PHP libraries have moved on and there's new ways of encoding things and it's become a lot simpler. So, you know, things evolve, things get change. Keep looking at it. Okay, let's take a look here. Hmm? Is it money? Yeah, yes, it is. It is indeed. Uh, Alistair Chapman, you'll be up after our next presenter. Um, and I just need to pull up this timer so I can start it once. Uh, it's the HDMI one. Yep. And it's plugged in. That was quick. Oh, really? Wow, cool. I didn't even expect that. Excellent. Uh, cool. So, microphone. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the Lua language. Uh, that's, that's my shtick. Uh, I don't know how many of you know it, but it's sort of like a like much better JavaScript. Uh, sorry? Uh, however, uh, for the last several years, um, I've been trying to think of a way to use it in the browser. Um, I've been pondering on it and gone through a series of projects. Uh, the latest one, which I've been working on for two years now, is a project called Fengari. Uh, so this is a home page. So, whoops, that's not matching the resolution on here. Can we? 
So I can't type with my left hand. Or, or my right hand, I need two hands. Uh, what resolution is it meant to be to match the 720p? Uh, so this is our homepage, fangaro.io, uh, and we've got working uh, Lua in the browser. So you can click it. Uh, you have full interoperability uh, with all of the DOM, uh, with no annotations needed whatsoever. You can call into any JavaScript you want. Um, you can use coroutines uh, as they are a feature of Lua. Um, so, for example, you you know can write asynchronous functions that don't actually block, and you just write them straight through. Um, none of the sort of callback mess in JavaScript. Uh, there's a REPL right here on the home page, uh, and the REPL itself is written in Lua. Um, so, you know, you, you, you're running in the same VM as you, you, you're writing. Um, so, to go in further, you can just uh, book the console and just run, run Lua like that. Uh, and if you want to do it in your own website, just dump a script tag on, uh, and any stuff that you write a script tag with type application Lua will get run as Lua instead. Uh, and you have everything that you can do in JavaScript, you can do in Lua instead. Um, so we've got all sorts of, working on all sorts of tooling around it. Um, there's the, the base core itself, there's the interoperability with JavaScript, um, the, the website itself. Um, there's, this is the same thing running on top of uh, Node.js. Um, instead of in the you know in the browser, uh, web, webpack loaders. Uh, you can even use like Electron and stuff. So you can write Electron apps in Lua. So if you feel like writing native but not at all, uh, so a VM on a VM on a VM. Uh, that's the way to write thing because binding Qt sucks. Uh, so yeah, if you, uh, I've got a presentation I made there. I was, I was going to crib off that, but I probably don't have that any time. Um, and so if you don't know Lua, uh, here's a great little resource. Uh, I'll learn 15 minutes. Um, and I hope that at least someone here is interested in giving it a try. Uh, so fengari.io. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, OK. Uh, so if Daniel Cross can get ready to, to be up here on stage. But first, uh, Alistair Chapman, who's going to tell us how not to docker, docker, docker. Docker. Uh, HDMI, is this one just here? I'm going to need a microphone stand because there are demos. Oh, okay. Uh, Tom, can you be a microphone stand? I can do that. Got to give the room monitor something to do. Is it started? Yep. All right. Um, I've known everyone, uh, if anyone was here, you obviously saw me earlier, but talking about something totally different this time, which is how not to docker. Obviously, everyone's pretty keen on their docker these days. When in doubt, just add more docker until your problems go away. If you have more problems, you need more docker. Just keep putting more docker in, and eventually you'll get there. Now, this is not covering all the wonderful, amazing things that are spectacular and generally amazing about docker. This is the things not to do when you're doing docker. Don't run privileged containers. A number of times I've seen a GitHub readme that says, oh, just run our container with the privilege flag. And what that is doing, it's saying, give root on my machine to whatever code this is running. I don't care what it is, I can't even tell, but just run it as root anyway. Give you a quick demo of what that looks like if I run a CentOS 7 image as privileged. I can now have a quick look at all of the devices and those are the devices on my host machine. Using privilege not only gives root to the container, it also grants all 27 Linux capabilities to the container running with no restrictions whatsoever and bypasses all of the C group requirements. Don't run privileged is the short version. Don't expose your Docker socket. The Docker D daemon exposes on Linux var run docker.sock. And there are plenty of tools, including uh, management tools, that will say, oh, just bind in bar on docker.sock into the container. It'll be fine. And a lot of them will suggest, oh, you can just do it with a read-only flag instead. And that's totally going to be not a problem at all. But of course, if you actually run a Docker container with the socket bound, as this one is, those are all the Docker containers on my host, not on my um, guest. Now, if I also very quickly spin up a container using 
CentOS 7 as an example, and bind mount in the root file system of my container, you'll have a look that the file system of the container is not actually the file system of the container at all. It's the file system of my host machine. Don't run the Docker, don't bind in the Docker socket unless you know exactly what is running in the container you're exposing it to. Don't use the host network mode, again, unless you know exactly what's going into it. Here's another CentOS machine running the, we're in host network mode, and here is a bunch of host network interfaces. Now, if those look strangely familiar, it's because those are the network adapters on my host, not in the container. The moment you change it to network host, the container has complete administrative control over the entire network stack, including changing all of your network interfaces, removing them, disabling them, or changing all the details without you even knowing. Know where your code is from. Everyone knows that they can, every image just starts with a from and you can put whatever you want in there. This one didn't get a demo done in time, but you can put literally anything in a base image and its consumers will have no idea. When they pull, it'll pull an updated version if you haven't set a tag and all of the things that happen in your base image, you don't see happen, they just magically appear in your container. Those can be things like, say, hooking into the prompt command to automatically send all of your environment variables off to some remote server you don't know about. They could be reading into your host container, or for example, if you do that with a privileged container, it can be reading your entire host file system. When you create a new Docker file and you look at what's in the from directive, make damn sure you know the whole way to the bottom of the dependency chain what code is in there. Or in other words, don't trust the internet. When you put from and some random image, that's what you're doing, you're trusting the internet. Don't forget your host. At any given time, whatever host I'm running in my container and whatever host I'm running on my host, sorry, whatever kernel I'm running in my container, whatever kernel I'm running in my host are exactly the same. If you run containers and try and isolate all your applications on an insecure kernel, you are not isolating anything because the containers are using the exact same running copy of your kernel. They will happily break out through any of the known vulnerabilities, of which there are some in older kernels, and most importantly, remember to install updates on hosts as well as your containers. In other words, when you're chasing after what the cool new bandwagon is, and there's so many great distributed microservices coming out, don't take that approach, because it will get you nowhere. Because pro tip, someone like me will get given the job of hacking into your shit. And if you do all of those things, we actually will. Thank you. Oh. Uh, thanks, Alistair. OK, so um, Daniel Cross is going to be giving our second last talk. And then Alexa, if you can uh, make sure, is he still in here? Yeah, he'll be next, so. Oh, you're plugged in. I should start the timer, shouldn't I? Lucky that I don't have my phone lined up. Right, there's your microphone. Oh, uh, do you want to mirror that? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, by the way, I'm either going to run out of five minutes or I'm going to run out of battery. Um, uh, oh, God. I can't remember how to do this. Yeah, see, my experience is usually I plug it in and it works. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Okay, cool. Um, my name is Dan Cross. I work in security. Um, I saw the talk before up there, so I thought, hey, I know, I'll come afterwards because I was looking at this last week. And here's some parts for some internal blog, which I'm going to be publishing on the internet. Um, as was just talked about, a um, bunch of things you shouldn't do. Basically, socket runs as root, hooks into your kernel. Docker client uh, on your user space runs as root. So um, you give a user, as you see quite often, what I see quite often is this, um, and I see it all the time. You want your developers, say you guys or anyone else, to have access on your prod box to be able to run some Docker commands. Group add Docker, they'll be able to run Docker. That's cool. They then get root. As we saw just before, they run a Docker they mount the, the socket or they mount your root file system. Boom, you're owned. Um, what we don't see in Docker very much is role-based user access control or role-based access control or any real access con control. I looked into it, doesn't seem to really exist. Um, so I started playing with it and um, doing something like this, which is pretty hacky, but it kind of works in a host where you've got uh, some Docker containers running and you want people to be able to do certain things but not all things and hopefully get some stuff. So we're basically going to wrap the Docker client in user space and then we're actually going to put a proxy in between the socket because that socket, if you ever want to just 
mess around with it, just send it curl, it just accepts HTTP, so you can put HA proxy there, set up a whitelist, hey, you don't want people to, to run, that's cool, they can just say, see what images are there or whatever you want them to do. So, came up with something which is a bit like this. Uh, um, here's our, uh, you know, our Docker user that's added to the group and they can do all the stuff. Um, as you can see from groups, yep, yeah, they're in the Docker group. Um, here's my admin user. This guy's going to run this, uh, this thing. Yeah, that's just been my armpit. I feel sorry for you now. Um, so we've just uh, run this. I'll show you the script in a second. And now people can run sudo docker. So uh, we've got this user here, which is another user. Um, pretty well unprivileged, as you can see up there. The, they've only got their own uh, group. And so they want to do this. They want to. You know, privileged, mount the host, uh, file system, all that sort of stuff. Oh, crap. G Docker. Boom. Yeah, so you're not allowed to do that. Um, we can uh, say, do what if you want to let them mount their own home directory? Um, cool, you can mount your own home directory, you know, things like that. Um, so that starts to get around that, uh, and that is a basic script, well actually it's a really hacky script, um, which I'm going to tidy up in open source in the next few days, but you've basically, it's probably hard to read, but you've got a whitelist up there. Um, I'm going to extend it out to allow kind of individual rather than just group access, you do some checks against the options that are given to Docker, um, and then down at the end, you basically run Docker with the split arguments, uh, and then do I have two minutes? What are, what are we up to? 42 seconds. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so another thing that you can actually do to get extra crazy on that, like I said, you can uh, proxy the socket. This guy's done with HA proxy, so I grabbed that, modded it a little bit, I've already run that guy's container, so I'm just going to run my installer again with support for that. And now this person's going to try to, let's see, where are we up to there? This person's going to try to run that again, and now they're not allowed to even run run. But they could. <laughs> okay, time. <laughs>